Hello and welcome. The term Global Capability Center might seem a little amorphous and not clear to many people. But what Global Capability Centers or GCCs have been doing is to really transform the landscape of skills, people, understanding, knowledge for global corporations first, but now playing a critical role in the Indian skill landscape, particularly in technology. So where can this go? What is the future like? And joining me to answer that is someone who is best equipped to do so, Devjani Ghosh, President of NASCOM. Devjani, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thank you, Ravan. Right. So uh, when, when you look at the GCC uh, landscape, it's really the multiplication of all the people that have been working in various centers and, uh, and, and uh, let's say the, the subsets of large companies in India mm. multi and into the, num the number of years they've spent on a certain vertical, a certain kind of knowledge and all of that is, added, is now adding up to something very powerful. So walk us through how you see this. Yeah. Uh, you know what it's adding up to and, and the, the power, uh, powerfulness that you talked about I'll go a little beyond. It's beyond the just the GCC segment, right? I think today India is the number one destination or the pref most preferred location for global GCCs, especially for R&D, right? One of the key reasons, actually, actually there are two key reasons for that. First is talent. Uh, we do have an advantage when it comes to talent. Uh, we have a stronger foundation in STEM, which is absolutely paying off now. Mm. It's helping. Uh, therefore, the ability to train people for the new kind of jobs and the new technologies is easier in India. So, talent brings people here. And the second one, which is an extremely powerful one and which is not just beneficial to GCCs, but beneficial back to the country, to India, is that India has a very connected ecosystem. Mm. You know, for us, the tech industry is not a this versus this or a either or story. It's becoming a beautiful and story, mm. you know, where GCCs are working with services, products, startups, Indian MNC collaboration, and net net, the entire ecosystem is benefiting from it, right? It's growing the innovation quotient in India. It's it's significantly growing the innovation. Um, culture, co-creation, it's growing capabilities, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's bringing about a change in mindset, much needed change in mindset as we move towards open innovation in the country, right? So I think the way we see it, I think the biggest advantage India has is that we uh, have that, that differentiation or that, that ability to really connect the ecosystem and make them play, right? Mm -hmm. GCC is the way I see it. Um, they have tremendous advantages in India. They have they have talent. They have a reasonably stable, consistent ecosystem. Uh, they have they have access to some of the best startups, etc. But they they also contribute a lot. Job creation is just one part mm -hmm. of it, right? They, they they become gateways for our startups, mm -hmm. for global markets, for technology mentorship, for experience. Uh, they engage in co-creation and partnerships with a lot of Indian companies. So they are also contributing to grow the overall R&D right. culture in India. Right. And let me qu pose the same question a little differently. So there is a coming of age yeah. for GCC. So why is that happening today? I mean, they've been around for a while in some cases or many cases, yeah. more than two decades. Yeah. Uh, but And yet there is something that has magically come together now. Or seeming, seems to be. Uh, well, what's changing is today, if you look at the GCCs, more and more you will see that uh, the nature of work is changing. So mm. they're moving from back end operations management to actual R&D. Mm. And they're moving to uh, pretty much game changing R&D out of mm. India, new mm. products, end to end product creation, end to end product uh, design and creation, right? That's new. And the reason it's happening again goes back to what I talked about. One, the access to talent in India. Mm. The ability to, to drive that end-to-end, -end, uh, create that end-to-end -end value chain in India. Right? It makes a big difference. You don't, you don't have GCCs in other countries that are pretty much a micro, microcosm of the overall mothership. Mm. And you have that in India mm. because we have access to the talent. Uh, we have access to a very strong ecosystem. I think these are our biggest advantages. Right, and someone was telling me that you know the founders of Flipkart came from a from an Amazon yeah, GCC yeah. essentially. Uh, so that we tells see you a lot of that happening. Yeah. Right. So uh, from a NASCOM point of view, what are, how are you looking at it as you look ahead, and uh, are you going to be do, are you doing things which are a little more proactive, uh, or is there things that you can do to keep this yeah. going? See again, uh, when I think of it from a NASCOM perspective, one we think of the overall ecosystem. 
and we think of the role that every one of these segments, be it GCC, startups, SME services, products, play in, in, in growing the strength of that overall ecosystem because that the, that's the, can be the biggest differentiator for India to have a strong end-to-end -end ecosystem mm, story mm, mm. and we have to build that you know mm. we have all the all the players on stage we just have to ensure that we we get them to work together mm. and well um, what's important for us is to ensure that every single segment is ability to transform and is ability to leverage the forces of change that I you know I, I because the, the there's some massive forces of change mm. at play now right um, so they're able to li li leverage these forces of change and emerge stronger and leverage it better and faster um, than competition, mm. right? And if you look at what, it, it's very difficult to predict uh, what change will ultimately look like because it's an evolution, mm. right? But if we, can, if we can start spotting the trends and if we can start understanding these forces of change, it's easy to, phys or at least, it's it's easier to start figuring out what does it take to navigate, what mm. does it take to leverage, and this is where it's you know the good old building blocks of you you must have the talent, you need to bring the build the capabilities, you need to up the innovation quotient, uh, you have to have a strong ecosystem, and you have to have uh, an end to end ecosystem, right? All of these c c things come to play. You must have a predictable regulatory framework within the country, right? That for us is the priority, right. because if we have to catalyze transformation, um, let's focus on the building blocks that are going to be critical for the transformation and do them better than anyone else to ensure that the industry can benefit, uh, you know, can leverage those to the fullest. Right. So two questions. So one somewhat predictable. So as uh, uh, in, the, in the era of artificial intelligence and machine learning, I mean all the digital stuff, uh, how imperative it is is it to move faster and or how ready are we or how well are we already moving in the gcc space to address the needs of the consumer sitting elsewhere and obviously that consumer is very demanding and uh, and and the second part is that uh, as as this grows uh, do you see uh, more people coming in or have we you know yeah. uh, have we already sort of got in whoever we could because they were obviously early adopters themselves no, that the growth in GCC is phenomenal. It's one of the fastest growing segments. Roughly, there's something like 1,200 mm. or 300 plus GCCs in India. Uh, just last year, we had, uh, I, I think, I know we had f over 40 uh, hardcore R&D GCCs that got added, but the total number mm. was even higher. Mm. So we are seeing... Um, the growth is not slowing down mm. definitely in fact um, and, uh, it's when you getting say growth, stronger you mean expansion as well as addition addition mm. okay. new gcc is coming in mm. so we're definitely uh, that's not slowing down and it's interesting to see the different kinds of companies coming in now mm. right i mean all the top global leaders pretty much have a play here and the the beauty of it is um, india is becoming home to r and d mm. And, and not just back-end operations, which is how it started with the cost-benefit, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the, it's the, the, the benefit or the value they find in India or they get in India is definitely moving up, uh, which, which is a great story. Um, so no, I, I absolutely do not see it slowing down anytime soon. I think as a country, uh, we can't take it for granted. Uh, what, what is bringing the GCCs over are what I talked about, mm. the fact that we do have the best talent. And the now, ability to, I mean, and the, the leapfrogging ability with the digital, in the digital world. In the digital world, but, but also we can't take talent for granted, right? The, the need today is more than STEM. Mm. Uh, the need today is STEM plus, 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 STEM plus domain plus art. So what, what we roughly called, broadly called digital talent, mm. right? So I think, and this is my biggest advocacy to government, talent or the di or the or digital talent can become india's biggest competitive advantage and we have to invest to make sure that it stays a competitive advantage if we have that if we become the hub for the world's digital talent uh, not only will the investment come but more importantly we get a seat at the global leadership table mm -hmm. and a strong voice at the global leadership table, which is so important in shaping the digital journey. You don't want to be left behind, mm. or you don't want to be 
uh, left out of the discussion that's happening at that table to shape which way this the, the digital era goes. Right, and, and I'm, I'm guessing this also plugs back once again into the future skills initiative that you're running. And oh yeah, it's, it's as I said, it has to be job one for country, therefore it has to be job one for NASCOM and future skills which is uh, not a NASCOM initiative, it's, it's an industry initiative, yeah. it's a government initiative. We are just playing the role of a catalyst by bringing it all together and ensuring that uh, everyone takes the, makes the effort to, to scale the initiative and it impacts as many people as possible is, uh, is the number one priority we have. Right. So, uh, I, I know you, you've talked about voice and what India can do in terms of innovation around yeah. voice. Uh, what would be your, uh, say, the one or two things that you would love to see happen here from an R&D point of view or a development point of view, which also will help in some ways define our position at that global stage or table that you were talking about? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take a step back. Uh, what I want to see from an overall India point of view, right? Uh, we are in that very interesting stage right now where the world is finally waking up to the fact, um, you know, we've all been saying data has value, data has value, data has value, right? Honestly, very few people understood what it means and what the value is. But now, we're finally waking up. I think, I think after Cambridge Analytica and quite a few of the things happened, finally beginning to understand what is the value of data. And the value of data is not the data. The value is how how quickly and how effectively we are able to process the data how are we able to call the insights out of the data how effectively are we able to use the insights to solve problems right that's the value Th that's the mm. benefit of data now uh, the world and and uh, you know one of my favorite authors uh, Yuval Harari talks beautifully about it uh, and he, he sums it up best where he says the world is entering an era of data colonialism, right? There are going to be countries that are great at producing data and mining data, and there are going to be a very few countries that are very good at processing data. Mm. And the countries that will process the data will hold the insights, which is the real value, mm. right? And I think, yeah, with a billion plus people, India will produce a lot of data. We are already producing a lot of data. Uh, we have to figure out how do we move from become a data producer or a data miner to a, to, to, to a data processor, to, to, to a country that can actually create the value out of the data. Now, while that's understood to some extent, I think we lose the plot when we equate that with where the data is stored and, mm -hmm. you know, how much data do we have. We have to look at the overall data value chain from creation to final production or impact. We have to look at the entire value chain and we have to figure out a play and that's why I keep saying India needs a data strategy, mm. an end-to-end -end data strategy. Data protection is just one part of it. Innovation is a huge part of it. You can protect all the data, you can hoard all the data, but if you don't have the talent, you don't have the know-how to process that data, it's useless. You're, just, you're sitting on rubbish. Mm. Or some other country is going to use what you have. Right? Yeah, and that's what I think Harari talks about as to well. To me, yeah. that's the big mm. one. We have to move from just consumption and creation of data to actually creating value. And that's the big one. Right. Jani, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. Thank you.